I have the pleasure to be a host today and present to you all Professor João Maia. Professor Maia is an associate professor at the Department of Macromolecular Science and Engineering of Case Western Reserve University and the director of the Center for Advanced Polymer Processing that stems from a partnership between Case Western Reserve University, Thermos High Tempe, and leading plastic and rubber companies. His main research interests lie in the areas of rheology applied to polymer processing, with an, with an emphasis on the development of new functional multiphase polymeric materials. He currently leads five scientific R&D projects and another two history. He has published more than 300 scientific works, including eight patents and more than 80 papers and journals. So welcome, Professor Maya. Thank you so much for being here, and please feel free to start your presentation. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Thank you uh, for the uh, invitation to uh, give this seminar. It's uh, my absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, uh, you will be glad to know that some of the things I'm going to be talking about today are, um, uh, were actually made in cooperation with uh, the uh, university over, over there, with the Federal do Rio. Um, and before I begin, I have to apologize for seeming to be looking in a, to, 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 towards a weird place, but whoever designed this computer thought it was a good idea to have the camera on the lower left-hand corner. So either I look at the camera and don't see the screen, or I look at the screen and it looks like I'm uh, looking towards infinity. Uh, I'm so sorry about that, but... Uh, uh, I'll make sure my next computer has a proper camera. Okay, uh, so uh, the uh, uh, title of my talk today is Mesoscale Modeling of Soft Matter with Dissipative Particle Dynamics. When I was invited to give this talk, I thought, all right, should I uh, dwell really uh, deeply into, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> into just one subject? or should I give an overview of the kind of things we're doing and the kind of potential that dissipative particle dynamics has. Um, and I decided to go with the uh, latter approach. So what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> after um, a brief introduction to mesoscale modeling and dissipative particle dynamics in particular, I will focus on three uh, uh, different systems, so I will uh, work on, I, I will talk about three different case studies <clears throat> that we have been working on in my group. Um, dense suspensions, emulsions, droplet deformation and breakup in um, emulsions, and um, uh, compatibiliz physical compatibilization and phase separation of emissible polymer blends with Janus nanorods. So three very different soft matter systems. I think that this will give you an idea of the breadth of possibilities that we have with this technique. All right, so very quickly, um, my R&D group, we are interested in rheological and physical design of soft matter systems. Right? So what we want to do is we want to design, we're a materials group. Um, we want to design complex multi-phase polymer, but not only other soft matter systems as well. And we want to control the functionalities through clever blending, compounding, and obviously developing then uh, engineering solutions. So my group um, as, a, as a whole is a bit of a two-headed monster in the sense that we have an experimental uh, thrust and the computational uh, thrust. In the experimental thrust, very quickly, what we do is what we call rheology for macromolecular groups. So the final properties in these complex systems depend on their uh, structure, and the structure depends on uh, the way they flow and their behavior on the flow. So that's what, we're gonna, that's what we're trying to do, to use rheology as the tool. And that means that we also have to develop uh, sensors to control, to monitor and control kinetics of whatever processes are happening, uh, we can make some very particular structures like, for example, these really thin films, like, for example, meat wrapping films with thousands of layers in there. Um, and as you see there, we can get down to 20, 25 nanometers per layer. 
when you do that, you're starting to approach the radius of gyration of a molecule and of a macromolecule of, of a polymer, sorry, yeah. And um, so basically bulk physics goes out the window um, and everything is interfacial physics. And what happens is that, for example, um, uh, uh, barrier properties uh, increase by orders of magnitude, whether it's air barrier, water barrier, et cetera, et cetera. And we also do some new clever ways of uh, improving blending and compounding. And as a rheology group, we do quite a bit of work also on understanding the extensional rheological behavior of fluids. And we even developed our own extensional rheometers. But that's not what I want to talk about today. This is just the overview. What I want to talk about today is the third thrust in my group, which is multi-scale computational model, for which we use uh, different uh, softwares. Okay, so why the need for multi-scale? Well, if you're doing modeling, you've probably seen this, this figure or something like it uh, at some point in your career. So basically, uh, what this uh, uh, figure tells you is that depending on what you want, you need to be able to access very different time scales and length scales. So for example, if we're talking about engineering design, typically parts can be made to last uh, hours, days, years, and they're macroscopic. Now, to do this engineering design, we need to do some process simulation, for example, um, the simulation of the injection molding process or, or the extrusion process, for which we use typically finite element or finite volume codes. Um, and now we're talking about uh, really a, a, a slightly lower scale and calculation times, for example, uh, of seconds, or minutes or hours. But the simulation uh, should take into account the structure that's formed, which brings us to the mesoscale. So the seconds, the microseconds, and the micrometer. Okay, the microscale, or the, what we call typically the mesoscale. Um, uh, so we need to understand the structure that's formed and how it feeds into the process simulation. And obviously, even that structure that's formed, like you see here in, um, like you see here, for example, depends then on um, what happens at the molecular level. This, for example, the self-assembly of these structures or things like that depend on what happens at the molecular level. So we have a multi-scale problem here um, that we need to solve. And the critical parts here are the transitions between scales. How do we move information from one scale to the next one, so from molecular to meso, for example, from meso to process simulation, to the, to the, to the continuum, without losing the physics, okay? Um, and that's very difficult to do. So everything typically starts with process simulation, and when it does, as I said, we typically use finite element or finite volume codes, and what these codes do is, what these, these codes do is they take the uh, con conservation equations, they use a constitutive equation that is based on a continuum, some sort of continuum mechanics model. It could be something as simple as a Newtonian fluid or, or law fluid or something as complex as a multi-mode full viscoelastic model like a Tankian Tanner or something. And the idea here is that once we do this and once we, once we solve this, then the velocity, the stress and the temperature fields. What's the problem here? The problem here is with the constitutive, the constitutive equation. Because these constitutive equations um, are based on continuum mechanics approximation. So they, there are averages everywhere. So they're not really good at predicting rheology of multi-phase systems because they're not, they do not have a continuum-like uh, behavior. And, and obviously, uh, rheological models don't give you morphology you the rheological quantity. So we need to replace this constitutive equation with something that reflects the structure that is being formed at the mesoscale. And that is where, um, uh, 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 that's where the mesoscale modeling codes come in. And you might ask, okay, but mesoscale, fine, why don't I just go to the molecular scale and calculate upwards? Well, it's not easy to do that. So for, for example, let's look at the time scales involved if you're trying to, 
uh, 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 model lip lipid bilayer dynamics, for example. Okay? Uh, and you have time scales that go from the picosecond, when you have the bond and angle fluctu fluctuation, to the microseconds. Okay? Now, in order to capture this physically, realistically, you need to have really, really small time steps, typically 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15. Which means that you need 10 to the 9 seconds just to get to the microsecond, right? or 10, 10 to the 9 steps. Um, so that's 1 billion steps. It, it, it's not really easy to get there. And really, the computational times involved limit the scales to at most the microsecond. All the computational power in the world cannot go over the microsecond. And this means you miss out on a number of on all the structure for formation, things like cooperative motion in phase transitions, uh, diffusions through membranes, phase separation, gelations, and so forth, right? Self-assembly. Um, so really, that's where we need to go up to the coarse grain. So how do we coarse grain? Well, we take, for example, in here, you have a simple polyethylene molecule, uh, macromolecule, right? Um, and we group together a number of repetitive units. So for example, here we can take like these three CH2 groups and um, we assign a simulation bead to them. This is the new simulation element, okay? So now what that means is that, for example, if you have this molecule and you go with an atomistic simulation, you have to calculate um, all the interactions for 118 sites because that's how many atoms you have in here. But if you do some, some coarse graining now, you only have 10 calculation sites. And because the maximum time step that you can use in your calculations depends on this length, uh, you now have, uh, you can now take much larger time steps, okay? And access much larger time scales and length scales. Of course, when we're coarse graining, and I'm not gonna talk about this today, but a big thing about coarse graining is you need to keep the correct thermodynamics. You need to keep the physics. For example, you need to reproduce the correct compressibility of the fluid. Um, and you need to, re to reproduce, for example, the solubilities of the various components. Right? So you need to keep the physics. And that is a, 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 a whole talk in and of itself that I will not uh, get into today. Now, as a consequence of this, um, as a consequence of this coarse graining, uh, we can take, for example, our, uh, our hard potentials like the Leonard-Jones potentials in molecular dynamics, which require very, very small time steps, and replace them with smaller, sorry, with weaker um, uh, repulsions or soft, not weaker, softer uh, repulsions. Right? So, for example, here, uh, in, in, in the case of this potential, you do not see... Um, uh, the, the divergence uh, near zero. And what this means is if you can keep most of the physics intact, um, then uh, you can typically gain three to four orders of magnitude at least compared to molecular dynamics. And there are many types of coarse grain codes. Um, and in my group, we typically use this one, dissipative particle dynamics, because we like the fact that it treats explicitly all uh, the components of the system, including the solvents, for example. When we're talking about fluids, typically there's a lot of solvent in there in a lot of cases. So we, we, we like dissipative particle dynamics. What is dissipative particle dynamics? All right, so dissipative particle, let's look at the fundamentals very quickly. So we, as I said, we're using soft potentials to allow the time step in the calculations to, uh, to, to be increased. Right? Um, so then what we do is we take our beads, okay, our DPD particles or DPD beads, we apply just basically Newton's second law to each particle, and then we can uh, de determine its position and velocity at every time step. And so what that means is that, um, okay, so if we have this system in molecular dynamics that we want to simulate here, so these three, uh, uh, these three macromolecules, uh, for, for example, in dissipative particle dynamics, now we solve this much simpler problem here on this. Okay, and then we have to have the right interactions. Now, in DPD, there are, in standard DPD, there are uh, 
as, uh, as uh, defined in 1992 by Hugerbrücke and Coleman, now there are three types of forces. Um, these forces F, D, and F, R are respectively the dissipative and the random force. Uh, the dissipative force basically reflects the energy dissipated by the system. Um, and the random force reflects the energy generated by the system. So what you can do is you can turn this into canonical MVP ensemble uh, by making the, these parameters, uh, uh, the friction coefficient and the fluctuation uh, parameter here, sigma and gamma, obey these relationships and so, and the omegas too. And if you do that, then you have the correct thermodynamic. Now, again, this is not an ideal thermostat uh, for many situations. Um, uh, again, we could talk about that uh, for another talk. We're not gonna do this. All the calculations I'm gonna show you today were performed with this thermostat. And then you have the force FC, which actually contains the, we call the conservative force, and it actually contains the interactions between uh, the different particles, okay? So what this force is, is a linearly decreasing force um, with respect to Rij, the radius between the centers of, of, of mass of two. Uh, and above a certain cutoff radius, the particles don't see each other. Below that cutoff radius, um, this uh, interaction force increases linearly up to a maximum Aij uh, when they come into contact. Now, this parameter Aij is critical because this is where the physics is. This is what gives us uh, the, strengths of the, uh, the strength of the interactions between different particles. Okay? And we can even, for example, uh, correlate this uh, Aij with uh, the uh, Corey Huggins chi parameter here. Now, if two particles are, if two particles are um, similar, so we have Aii, this Aii is 25. Anything above 25 means a repulsive system. Anything below 25 means um, an attractive system. So for example, the AII between green beads here is 25, between red beads is 25, between green and red, it's something else, okay? So that's how we do it. And what this means is that DPD is very, very flexible. So by uh, defining the, um, by defining the different um, uh, uh, types of beads, we can do everything from liquid crystalline polymers or block polymers to different polymer architectures to rigid fibers and so forth, right? So very, very powerful. We like it very much. Okay, so first case study. Um, uh, emulsions, okay? Uh, droplet, um, uh, 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 droplet deformation and uh, breakup um, in emulsions. Um, in the presence of surfactants. Okay, so this is based in, uh, on a paper that we are still working on, we're still preparing. Um, hopefully it'll, it, it will be submitted before the end of the year. So let me just frame the project, the problem very quickly. Um, so sur surfactants, we all know what surfactants are for. Sur surfactants are used to decrease um, the uh, surface tension um, and uh, make things more compatible. Uh, so, for example, the fact that we have, surf we have to have surfactants in the surface of our lungs, otherwise the lungs would collapse, okay? And um, there, and, and, and surfactants come in many geometries. They can come, depending on the applications, nature has decided to make um, some surfactants linear, some surfactants branched, or even star uh, shape. So, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Why did nature decide to do this? It would have been so much easier just to um, have everything linear, okay? What, what we find is that by through both experiments and simulations is that typically branched, um, uh, uh, branched sur surfactants tend to yield a bigger decrease um, uh, to be more, more efficient uh, uh, than, um, than uh, linear surfactants. So they promote a bigger decrease in surface tension, okay? All right, so um, droplet def deformation, how does this imply um, 
how does this affect the, the dynamics of droplet deformation and breakup? Okay, now we can, if we have a simple droplet, we can visualize and model very, very simply how it's going to deform under shear flow, for example. No problem. The thing is, once we start adding surfactants, um, this is the ideal uh, line here, uh, and we can even predict this analytically uh, using uh, uh, Taylor, Taylor's theory. Um, but once you start adding surfactants, you see L over A is just the ratio, uh, the ratio of the two uh, axes of this ellipse, right? And what you see is that the ellipse becomes elongated. So the, the, the surfactants help deform the uh, droplet. They promote droplet de de uh, de uh, deformation via, essentially via a decrease of the surface tension, which means higher capillary numbers that will deform the, the droplets more. So the question is, what is the influence of surfactant architecture in droplet deformation? That's the question uh, uh, we're trying to answer. And what I will give you today is just the 30,000 foot view of, I will not get into the details, obviously there's no time for that. I will give you the, um, the um, uh, 30,000 foot view on what we're doing. All right, so let's begin. Uh, so, so surfactants can, can, can be uh, soluble or insoluble. Um, let's begin with the water uh, uh, in oil emulsion with linear surfactants soluble linear surfactants, and what we call H2 and H5 classes. What does this mean? Well, it means that we have the surfactant here, right? And H2 means that the uh, hydrophilic, this is, remember, this is a uh, water in oil. The hydrophilic head, A has two DPD beads um, in, in, in this case. Um, uh, or it has five DPD beads, okay? And the same thing for the hydrophobic tail. So in this case, this surfactant is an H2T5, two beads in the head, five beads in the tail. The one in red here is, with the red background is H2T, two, 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 bead, two beads in the head, one bead in, in the hydrophobic tail. And what you see is, so this is the normalized uh, surface tension. Um, uh, so the, the surface tension of the clean interface is one. And as we add surfactant above about 100, they, um, the surface tension decreases abruptly, okay? Um, and interestingly, so what happens is that if we have the short surfactant, right? Uh, it will just spread evenly around the droplet surface, fine. Uh, so it's very effective. Um, if you have the longer tailed surfactant, now they are, as you, as you get more and more um, surface coverage, they start interacting with each other and they actually wanna leave the droplet surface and form their own micelles, okay? And because there's only two heads in there, two, two head beads in there, uh, there's nothing much to uh, make them stick to the uh, actual uh, water droplet. So um, the, 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 the uh, effectiveness actually decreases compared to the short tail. So, um, um, uh, so. um, if you go to now to the H5, so now you have a longer head, five beads, so they're anchored to the uh, water droplet um, uh, in a much stronger way. What you see is um, that now you have a more effective surfactant because the long tail anchors the, pulp, the surfactant to the, um, to the droplet, okay? So you don't have this formation, this micelle for, for. And what happens is that if, if it even gets uh, if you can get to the point where you have very, very long tails here, this is a tail, a seven beat tail, instead of leaving and forming micelles, um, actually the actual surfactants will deform the, um, the droplet and form a Langmuir uh, monolayer at the interface. So now what happens if we apply shear? 
Well, if we apply shear, um, now what we're doing is, um, let's see, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, if we're applying shear, um, let's see what happens to the droplet uh, deformation. So we're seeing these conditions here. So all these pictures are for an iso strain. So the same 5% strain with the linear surfactants of H5 class. So they all have five uh, uh, B uh, heads, okay? And uh, we always have 300 uh, surfactants per, per molecule, and they are insoluble, right? Um, uh, sorry, they are soluble. This is a mistake. Um, this is actually a mistake. Th these are soluble. These, this is the same system. Um, just very soluble. Okay, these are soluble. And what you see is that um, as you increase the size, the, the, the size of the tail, the droplet gets more and more deformed. So it will, um, like the theory predicts, uh, or like we've seen experimentally, um, the deviation from the Taylor prediction is larger. But there's one thing, uh, uh, but there's one thing that's very interesting. In, interesting. Let's go back to the case without shear, for example, for a moment. The case without shear here. The, um, um, the H2, the H, uh, the H5T2 and the H5T7. At rest, they have pretty much the same, the same efficiency. All right, look at what happens under shear. Now under shear, as the droplet is deformed, the um, uh, longer tail uh, surfactant is much more efficient and actually breaks up the uh, droplet for five. Okay, so this is very interesting. Uh, at, at rest, they have the same behavior, but under shear, they have a completely different behavior. Now, what about insoluble surfactants? Um, in this case, we looked at linear, um, linear surfactants, star surfactants, and branched surfactants, okay? And uh, we can calculate the pressure drops uh, across the interface, and with that, cal calculate the surface tension, and we see that the surface tension decreases as it should with increasing concentration, uh, and that the branched and the star surfactants are more effective than the linear ones. And if you go and look at simulations and experiments, especially these simulations here, you see that we are in agreement with those simulations, with those prior sim simulations. If you have insoluble solvents, and if they are uh, branched, which is the field symbols, they will be more efficient. Okay? And we can actually look and calculate the uh, deviation from the Taylor uh, limit, okay? So, uh, but we can look at what happens to the surfactants. Now, because these surfactants are insoluble, they can actually move inside the, uh, or, or at, the, at the interface very, very easily. And what you see is very interesting is as the droplet gets deformed, the, the, the surfactants tend to migrate to the areas of large curvature. So you do not have a homogeneous distribution of surfactant across the interface. And when you compare this with, uh, this is for three, concent three different concentrations. When you compare this um, with the Taylor limit, you can see again, the uh, easier deformation of the droplets caused by the surfactants. We can now actually do something that's um, uh, more, um, uh, that's easier to, to look at visually and look at the influence of, sur of surfactant architecture for constant um, con concentrations. And what you can see is that if you have a lot of surfactant in the system, for example, here with 20%, it doesn't really matter what the architecture is. Okay? All the results will be the same. Um, but if you have relatively low uh, surfactant con concentrations, you do see differences at intermediate shear rates and you see that actually um, in opposition to what you saw for soluble surfactants, for insoluble surfactants, the linear surfactant is actually more efficient, okay?
So these are the main conclusions. We can go back to these, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll move on and go to the second case study. And the second case study is something now completely different. Based on uh, these three papers that we published um, in the last few years. Um, so we're gonna be looking at uh, uh, rheology and microstructure of dense uh, deformable colloidal suspension. Now, if you've worked with suspensions before, uh, you've, uh, you've seen this picture. Typically, uh, this is a classical picture from uh, Wagner and Brady, and it shows you how the rheology of dense suspensions changes with shear stress or shear rate uh, in general, right? And there are three main regimes. The first regime is the so-called equilibrium regime. Uh, and, and in the equilibrium re regime, uh, Brownian motion dominates. So it doesn't matter if you have small particles, intermediate particles, or large particles, um, Brownian motion rules everything. And the viscosity is pretty constant at uh, low shear rates. At higher shear rates, you now um, start getting something different. You start getting uh, alignment and, and, and the, this formation of layers by the particles, and that results in a decrease of the viscosity. Eventually, um, what happens is that as you deform the system too quickly, the viscosity starts increasing and the systems become thickening. And this can happen in one of two ways. It can happen either uh, slowly, progressively, what we call continuous shear thickening, uh, until you get to a, to a shear jammed state, as you can see there, or things can happen very quickly, but you still end up with the shear jammed state. And these pictures here on the left are just to show you that colloidal systems do not have to be micro, uh, they don't have to be micron sized, they can be cars. All right. Still a colloidal system, the same physics applies. All right, so um, people are typically interested in studying this shear thickening region, the last region. Um, and there are two main competing theories of why the viscosity increases with shear. First one is based on hydrodynamics principles. It basically says that um, hydrodynamics brings the particles together due to the shear gradients. They form these large aggregates uh, and that will lead to the viscosity. Okay, now that is very interesting. Um, and it, it's, it, it's clearly physically very, vali very, uh, uh, very uh, valid, very um, valid and one thing that's interesting about hydrodynamics is that it predicts negative first normal stresses. So if you have two particles and they're coming together, okay, you have a depletion effect because the, 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 um, the solvent in between the particles gets expelled as they get together, which means that there's a differential in pressure between the free side of the particle and the side of the particle that's near the other particle and that will suck the particles together. So you have two particles coming together, and the closer they are, the closer they want to be. And that results in a negative first normal stress. Now, one thing that hydrodynamics cannot predict is that very large, very quick, uh, discontinuous shear thickening. And that, and, that left people, and that led people to come up with a frictional theory, saying that you have a, frictional contact, uh, you have a network of frictional contacts that's formed, and this can indeed explain uh, discontinuous shear thickening. Because when these frictional particles come together, now they jam and the increase in viscosity is very quick. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that as two particles come together, if they're frictional, now they want to separate. That leads to a positive first normal stress difference. So really the first normal stress difference is the litmus test for uh, which um, which type of forces is dominant. And some recent work uh, by Royer et al. shows that uh, for low, um, for semi-dense suspensions, N1 is always negative, which means th thermodynamics rules. But for very dense suspensions, up to 58%, N1 goes negative before it goes positive. And friction and thermodynamic and, and hydrodynamics alone cannot explain this, all right? So that's what we try to do. We're using our DPD code to see if we can model this. And 
So now what we have to do is we have to change the, um, uh, uh, we have to expand the DPD model to something we call frictional core modified. So we still have the first, the same three uh, forces, but now we have some non-contact interactions, the elasticity, um, because we can make particles deformable, okay, or rigid, and the hydrodynamics. So I will not get into details now for the sake of time. I can talk about it uh, during the Q&A the, the period if you want to, but we also have some frictional interactions. Okay? And we have, uh, so here is the particle elasticity again. Um, so this is actually electrostatic, sorry. Not, um, uh, this is electrostatic, uh, so this is for charge. Um, this is where the elasticity comes in, okay? And we have a friction coefficient. Okay? And we're gonna look at two different types of particles. Smooth particles with a low friction, co with a low co co friction, of co uh, uh, friction coefficient and a, a very rough particle with a very high friction co coefficient. And we're gonna look at semi-dense suspensions, 48%, and dense suspensions, 58%. So very quickly, what we can find is that our results clearly predict that they are in agreement with experiments and uh, they can predict discontinuous shear thickening here, for example, where we uh, uh, also compare with some uh, uh, other frictional models. Okay, so this is good. So we can, we can, uh, we can um, predict uh, continuous shear thickening, shear thickening and discontinuous shear thickening. But what about the first normal stress difference? What about N1? Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, before that, yes. Yeah, so one thing that we also see is that, for example, uh, I'm showing you just results here for the rough particles. Obviously, as you increase particle softness, this shear thickening tends to go away and eventually the system becomes shear. So because what happens is that when two particles come into contact, now they start to deform. So it's much more difficult to, to get into the jammed state, okay? Nothing special there. But what about um, N, N1? Well, there you go, look at this. So in blue, uh, we have, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, in blue, we have the semi-dense suspension. N1 is always negative, um, which, is, uh, which is clearly in agreement with experiments. But now, for the dense suspensions in green, if you have smooth particles, so low friction, N1 is still negative, but if you have rough particles, now N1 is negative and then it grows positive. And this is in very good agreement with the results of Royer uh, and co-workers, right? And this was the first time that this transition from negative to positive N1 was conclusively shown computationally. So we can get the rheology, right? Uh, what's causing it now? Well, we can look, the beauty about the computations is that we can look at things separately. So we can look, for example, here at the, for the semi-dense suspension, we can look at the number of, lub, uh, of um, um, uh, lubrication bonds and the number of frictional bonds here in the squares. And you can see that for semi-dense suspensions where we do not have discontinuous shear thickening and then one is always negative, the lubrication bonds always dominate. But for the dense suspension, now the lubrication bonds begin by dominating, but then they get overtaken by the frictional bonds. So clearly something happens at a certain shear rate or Peclet number or stress. In fact, this is, a con this is a constant stress effect. Something happens that makes the number of frictional bonds shoot through the roof and the number of lubrication bonds decrease. Now, what is it? Um, so let me just give you a, a f first a, 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 um, a very quick introduction to network theory. So we call the giant cluster or giant component to the largest set of nodes that are connected to each other okay, in a network. So if you have a random network, G, uh, that's a function of the number of nodes and, and, and has a certain probability of bond formation, that probability of bond formation follows a Poisson dis distribution, okay? So if our frictional network follows the same type of statistics, it's a random network, then it should also follow a Poisson di distribution. And um, in fact, it does. 
So for example, this is the case for the semi-dense, uh, and you can see that um, uh, the, the uh, uh, So we have a frictional, so what happens is that at that constant stress, this frictional bond network is formed. The question is how large is it? And for that, we need to go to the MR value, the second moment distribution. And if, M, if this MR is positive, then uh, we uh, have a percolated network. If not, we do not have a percolated network. And for the semi-dense suspension, MR is always negative which means that even the larger frictional uh, network is not percolated, it's, it's not system spanning. Whereas for the dense su 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 suspension, now you have a positive MR, which means that you do indeed form a percolated network. And the last question I wanna answer is, okay, it's not percolated in one case, it's percolated in the other. How big, how many particles are there in, in, in each of them? And if we look at the dense system and we look at the percentage of particles in the, uh, the percentage of particles in that giant cluster, what we see is that at low Peclet numbers or low shear rates, we have these fluctuating, um, the, these clusters forming and breaking up. And eventually the largest, the largest, um, uh, uh, the largest cluster you form has about 40% of the particles in it. For the 58% um, of the dense suspension, now you can see there, you get about 90% of the particles. It's a percolated network, right? And about 90% of the particles in there. And not only that, but the kinetics of its formation actually becomes uh, independent of the um, of the uh, um, of the Peclet number. Okay, so again, um, to conclude, what we see is that both types of interactions are required, uh, and then we have a transition from uh, hydrodynamics dominated to friction dominated. At which point, you form a uh, large random percolated network that has almost all of the particle systems in it. Finally, very quickly, I'd like to go to the last case study, uh, which is the phase separation uh, of immiscible polymer blends stabilized with Janus nanorods. And uh, I wanna talk specifically about this one because this is a project that was developed by a PhD student, Felipe Paiva, in collaboration with Argemiro Sec and Veronica Calado um, at UFRJ. Um, uh, and this was a, a, a PhD project uh, done within the scope of the uh, CAPES uh, Case Western PhD program. Um, uh, and Felipe just graduated uh, this summer and he's now doing a postdoc at Pucrio. Um, and I will get back to Felipe later. Um, so Janus particles were first brought to the public eye by uh, uh, De Gen uh, in his Nobel lecture. And basically these are particles that are highly amphiphilic, highly surface active. Basically they have two sides. One side may be hydrophobic, one side may be hydrophilic. And that's why they're called Janus because Janus was the uh, uh, Roman God of two faces. So they, it had two faces. So these particles are very interesting uh, because then now they can be made to behave almost like rigid surfactants for, for example, but uh, permeable uh, uh, rigid surfactants. Um, but most work done so far has been done on aggregation, uh, on bulk aggregation of these particles, okay? uh, uh, because they're very highly inter interfacially active. Uh, the question is how are, inter so the questions we're interested in, in answering is, uh, how are interfacial aggregation and phase separation kinetics related? And what defines the dynamics? So computationally, people have looked at these systems too, but uh, essentially with molecular dynamic simulation. So basically they take care, they look at what happens to one or a few um, um, uh, genus particles at the time um, when what we're trying to look at is that micron-sized large structures. Um, uh, so what, ha what happens when instead of uh, one particle, you have many particles? And what happens when instead of having just uh, spherical particles, you actually have rigid 
nanorods, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use the DPD sim simulations to look at interfacial aggregation and phase separation of blends, um, okay? So we, we, de we define these, we, we build these uh, symmetrically antithelic rigid genus rods, okay? Uh, we can make them uh, with an aspect ratio of two or of four, so short or long rods, and we can make, uh, uh, we can then have a polymer blend A and B. And as you can see here in the AIJ values, uh, the, AI, the AII values are always five, uh, but we're now making the red side of the genus rod uh, very little uh, compatible. So with just an AIJ of 28 with the white polymer A that we're not showing here just for the sake of clarity and the yellow side compatible with B. And everything else is highly repulsive, so very high AIJ values. So what, and, um, what we can look at, we can look now at, at, at the aggregation of the genus nanorods at the interface, and we begin with the flat interface, and we can look at how they're tilting relatively to so We can look at this cosine squared value. If this cosine squared value is zero, they are standing at the interface. If it's one, they are lying at the interface. Uh, and if it's 0 0.3, basically they're randomly distributed. So for short aspect ratio rods, what we see is that, and this is at rest very quickly, they move to a standing configuration, right? Very low cosine squared of theta. You can see them here from the top. Most uh, of what we can see are the uh, uh, white, uh, the red tips. Okay. But if we go to the larger rods, now what we see is a much more random uh, type of um, packing. <clears throat> and, um, and that's very interesting. So they're tilted and in, in a much more random way, right? So what happens under shear? Now under shear, that's where things get interesting. For example, let me show you results for the short rods. Um, you can see here that at rest, they, they as, as I said, they have a very low, um, very low, uh, 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 they're essentially um, standing on the surface. As you increase the Peclet number to an intermediate value of about 76, what you see is that they undergo this um, initial transient and then they settle on mostly a lying uh, standing configuration two, as you can see here on the right. Okay. But then as you go to higher Peclet numbers, higher shear rates, you start getting these spikes in the cosine squared, which means that they're tumbling. And what happens is that very interestingly, look at this, they actually tumble not by one, but they, they have this cooperative tum tumbling motion of large segments of, of, of large uh, blocks of rods. And what's even more interesting is that when we stop the, the shear, let them relax, they get trapped. They, they stay trapped with the wrong tilt. So um, clearly there's a, a, um, a, a really big competition between entropy and enthalpy here. Um, and that's uh, obviously that would be a story just for its own presentation, but this is just to show you uh, the incredible rich behavior that uh, we can find here. And finally, just for the last couple of minutes, and then I'll shut up. Um, we also looked at morphologies for the blends under shear and relaxation. So for example, here, we're just using 2% uh, 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 nano rods uh, with an 8515 blend uh, of short rods. So at rest, here they are, they aggregate. Um, Okay, at the uh, interface, so we're looking at it from the from, uh, from the top. Um, and then here, as we start shearing, what we see is the formation of these cylindrical droplets, okay, with the, with the, um, uh, with the uh, uh, nano rods at the interface. And then uh, as we stop the shear and they relax, this is relatively unstable. So these cylindrical droplets tend to go away and we tend to have phase separation, okay? So from left to right is time, and from top to bottom is shear rate. So this is mild shear rate, this is a strong shear rate, okay? So strong shear rate causes cylindrical droplets, but then they relax, and it basically phase separates. If we now go to long rods, 
what we see is pretty much the same type of behavior, but the morphology is a little bit more um, stable. Things start getting interesting now when we go instead of an 85-15 blend to a 50-50 blend here. And what you see now is a completely different type of morphology. Now, as we shear, regardless of the um, shear rate, we now go to, a we now obtain a type of lamellar morphology with a flat interface, okay? That's pretty stable once you stop the shear. But if you go to the long rods, now, the same thing happens, except that now, instead of lamellar, you have this cylindrical configuration, right? But it's also flat and stable. So again, um, we can manipulate the type of interface by uh, manipulating the shear rates, the processing conditions, the constitution of the blend, the amount and uh, characteristics of the genus nanorod. So it's very interesting. Again, conclusions, I'll go through this very quickly because I want to uh, uh, call your attention to the first global symposium on Janus nanoparticles. This is going to be a virtual symposium uh, that's going to be held on October 1 and 2. Um, and it's being organized by Felipe, my former PhD student, now postdoc at Puki, and Shahraya Hani, my uh, 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 postdoc and uh, an adjunct professor here in our department. Um, so this is going to be very interesting, very large, very good uh, selection of speakers already lined up. And the best thing is that the registration is free. You can register this, just go onto this website, register, and then uh, take part in this. So now I would like to finish uh, just by acknowledging the people that have made this possible, the students, the postdocs, um, CAPES for the funding of the um, uh, PhD of Felipe and UFRJ, the National Science Foundation, the High Performance Computing Cluster at Case. And with that, I will stop and I will take any questions you may have. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor João Maia, for the enlightening presentation. We now open the floor to questions and anyone uh, that have a question uh, can enable the microphone and speak your mind or maybe write it in the chat and we can read it. So who, is, who wants to be the first? John, yeah. I, have a, I have a silly question for you. Okay. <laughs> ah, those are the words. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, when you talk about the frictional interaction, uh, the, my question is why particles want to separate when they, there are frictional interactions? Um, I, well, basically, you, you can imagine two, um, two particles coming. Can you? Yes. So you, you can imagine the two particles coming together, right? And yeah. when they come into contact, if they are frictional, they'll want to separate. So uh, sea urchin don't like each other. <laughs> Sorry? Sea urchin. Yeah, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, urchins. Yes. Yeah, so sea urchins. Two, two urchins coming Together. So they don't like each other. So they don't do the kids. <laughs> they they may like each other. They well, they're like brothers, right? They may like each other, but they hate each other also. <laughs> okay, uh, because then, so obviously, one thing I didn't talk about here, but also you can um, elect you 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 can um, make them uh, active electrostatically or not. You can do some electrostatic shielding on the system or not. Okay, um, so there are many things that that actually uh, uh, affect how, um, uh, so, uh, how, natural, how, how they're uh, going to form the, more, the structure. Yeah. The, yeah, this is related to the roth surface, uh, I, I suppose, no? the, the structure of the roth mm -hmm. surface that the particle mm -hmm. has. So there is some electrostatic interaction that make this repulsive force and so on. Yep. And this, uh, what you are trying to put in the model, these uh, yes. frictional interactions, right? Well, we actually would be, the electrostatics is actually put into the model uh, uh, explicitly. Electrostatics is put explicitly into the model. Let me, uh, let me go back to sharing my screen. And... In a me field way, yeah? because I have a, a screening. Uh, yes. Day. Yes. Okay. So uh, let me share my screen again. Okay, you see there, that's the electrostatic. All right, that's good. That's the electrostatic repulsion. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. 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 What my problem is, uh, DPD is, uh, I don't know how to, to define uh, the, the parameters for surfactants. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, it's, uh, it's, uh, Felipe has some kind of these problems. Uh, so, we, have, we are going to have a hard time to define. And, and it seems to me that A is very sensitive. So, uh, at the other hand, hand is, uh, if you have a, a surfactant that's more polar or less polar, it's yep. not so easy to, to, to get these correct uh, parameters. No. And, yes. and also the electrocyte in, in, interactions is not easy at all because uh, uh, at the interface, you are not in the middle. So the screening is not clear uh, what the screening means. Well, uh, in principle, uh, uh, the electrostatic interface. In principle, the electrostatic screening can be dealt with. So, first disclaimer: we didn't uh, uh, do it for this uh, system, um, but in principle, it could be dealt with the same way. So, the advantage, the advantage of uh, DPD is that it treats uh, all the components in the system explicitly. So, it doesn't, so I wish I had a, a board that I could draw now, but uh, it doesn't, so it, it will treat differently. For example, a linear and a branched surfactant, it will treat the electrostatics differently uh, in a linear and, a, and a, a branched surfactant, for example, right? So DPD, you could call it the first level up for molecular dynamics because everything is treated explicitly. Uh, whereas for, for example, in things like Stokesian dynamics, uh, the solvent is implicit. So Stokes and dynamics is a lot more complicated. And Stokes and dynamics is a lot more complicated to look at things like surfactants with surfactants than it is in DPD. DPD actually deals with, the, with it explicitly. The, the thing about DPD is you need to have the right physics. So you, like we did in core modified DPD, the extra forces you bring in need to be uh, physically relevant and, 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 and physically feasible, okay? Um, um, but, uh, yeah, so, so, but as long as you know the, 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 the form of the potential, DPD in principle can deal with any system complexity and deal with, uh, uh, with electrostatics, for, for example. But it's, it's hard to, to relate this to real surfactant. Like, okay, you, you, can, you can see some effect, like you increase the, uh, the side uh, change. Well, one thing you can do, for, one, one thing you can do, for example, right, is if you have the real surfactant, you can look at it at the surfactant solubility, right? That gives you the Flory Huggins sky. And then you can calculate the corresponding AIJ. That's how you bring the, the solubility into it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So obviously our values for the parameters, the values I've shown you here um, are basically for the surfactants. They're not based on, on anything real, but if you had a real system, you need to find the, the solubility. Once you find the solubility, then you can calculate a, a, a good AIJ number. Okay. Uh, let me ask you another question. Uh, how can we apply the shear at, at two phase of uh, systems? Uh, do you apply at the edge of the, the box? Or yes. because uh, do it yes. depends, uh, the results depend on the amount of edge phase? Because. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, so the answer is yes. Basically, we use, I, I didn't talk about it here for lack of time because I wanted to focus on the physics, but basically we use Lee's Edwards, we have a calculation box, and we use a Lee's Edwards type of approach for the boundary conditions. So, system, um, 
and then obviously we have to try out different box sizes to make sure that we 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 get we get rid of the box size effects. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. There's, Raja, there's, there's a question here. There's yes. a question here uh, from Richard Ellis uh, in the chat, and then uh, 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 ooh, an, uh, another one. Okay, from uh, Christian Wanirar Jagopal, I think so. This is the migration of surfactant to high curvature due to shear or curvature. Um, okay, so in this case, uh, we believe that the migration of the surfactant to the um, curvature is basically due to entropic effects. So, so where you have the uh, larger curvature, you have less probability of the um, uh, basically the the the, the uh, surfactant not interfering with each other. All right. Um, okay. So next question. Uh, uh, let it. He should open your your camera, uh, please. Okay. Did I answer your question? I don't know. So uh, move on to Raja. Uh, um, first, I comment to you, it's beautiful transparency and direct percolation. I really wonderful transparencies. But I, I want some clarifications. Yeah. Let's take an equilibrium for concrete example, say a lipid bilayer, a surfactant, say SDS or something like that, both the same sulfate approaches. What do you think is important, swelling or stretching? Or, or <laughs> swelling or stretching? The elastic, it alters the elasticity of your solution or it increases the volume of the solution, creates voids, a surfactant like say SDS. Oh, that, <laughs> that is a good question. I, I, I've never thought about it. Uh, uh, oh gosh. Um, I, w I would probably have to vote against elasticity. Um, because the, the higher the higher the elasticity of any of the layers, the more difficult it is. So I'm just thinking about in terms, for example, of the same thing uh, as emulsions. If you have an elastic droplet, have a Newtonian droplet, it's easier to break the, the uh, Newtonian droplet. The elasticity basically tries to keep um, the droplet together. So I think, and, and again, as I said, I've, I've never, uh, I, I've never thought of the, lip, of the uh, lipid bilayer. I use that example because I took it out of a book because all the things <laughs> were there. Uh, but I would imagine, um, but I would imagine that elasticity would work against the system, um, uh, uh, this, the system de destabilizing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm not saying something completely stupid, but sorry. No, 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 it's very, it's, it's an interesting question, actually. It is, uh, apparently, in other areas, some guys prefer elasticity over swelling. I am in favor of swelling, by the way. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> right, so, so. right answer. <laughs> right answer. <laughs> good, good. I like it. <laughs> so, the, the another question I want to ask you, actually a clarification. About the methods, what do you think of the diffusion equation? Like, uh, say, Schoffer or something like that. Use a Brownian motion and some, especially if you are evaporating solvent. Even without flow, say some way operational. Yeah, di diffusion is such a uh, diffusion is such a, 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 a tough subject um, because it's because you have to look at diffusion of what, right? Diffusion of momentum, diffusion of, um, and that is actually one of the problems. For example, with DPD uh, 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 under flow, many times the so the Schmidt number, for example, is totally off. 
uh, in which case, uh, so we've done some work on that. Um, and that's when, when that's the case, we use a different thermostat. We div, we, that replaces that, the random and dissipative force. Uh, we use a low Anderson thermostat that is much more, uh, that it's much more re realistic in terms of capturing diffusion and high Schmidt number problem. But the non-local interactions may not be more difficult to include in this case. Would you say that? Yes, say I would. Yes, yes, I would agree with that, yes. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. There are many other doubts. <laughs> Another time maybe I have to write to you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, if you have any more questions, just let me know. Uh, may I ask one? Of yeah, course. sure. So very nice talk, uh, João. Thanks a lot. Well, m my question is more uh, philosophical because you could have a coarse-grained MD simulations, right? Instead of DPD simulations. And uh, <laughs> yes, but the basic coarse graining, uh, basically just coarse-grained MD, uh, for for example, doesn't doesn't give you hydrodynamics. It, it, it doesn't give you the lubrication, for example. Um, uh, so in some systems you may get away with it, uh, but coarse graining MD is very, very limited in the type of interactions that it can deal with. Just simply coarse grained MD, right? Uh, so for, ex for example, this, this, um, uh, uh, this frictional uh, core modified DPD, right? There's no way you're gonna be able to capture in, in fact, DPD was initially developed for suspension because coarse grain wasn't enough. But the original DPD wasn't enough either, so people came up with this core modified to be able to capture the right physics and the right types of interaction. So coarse grain molecular dynamics um, is very, uh, uh, it, it has its place, don't get me wrong, it, it, it has its place, but when you have multi-phase systems, when you have interactions between different species, um, it's very limited. So you think it's not a matter of parameterization? No, no. It's, it's an inherent limitation, yeah. Well, you could also think about a modification of the, of the equations of motion and also of the potential. And well, as you said, I mean, you had your modified DPD model, right? Yes, so, yeah. and, and, then, and, then, and then I, I had a slide, right? So, uh, um, coarse grain models, because coarse grain molecular dynamics isn't enough, then people come up with other coarse grain models. So everybody has their own favorite. Uh, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, I, I prefer pineapple, so I'll go with the <laughs> I like strawberries, so I'll go with lattice Boltzmann. Um, uh, so it really depends on the, pro on, the, on the processes. I mean, the reason we like DPD in our group is because we're a rheology group, right? Uh, I, I'm a rheologist. I believe all the problems in the world can be solved by rheology, world hunger, world peace, and all of that. Um, so uh, you need to find a way, if you're a rheologist, you need to find a way to deal with uh, solvents and with continuous phases, right? And the beauty of DPD, as I, as I told Fred earlier, is that it allows you to explicitly consider right, all of the... Um, the interactions between all of the species in your system. Um, so you can then, for, for example, you, you can then take those results and average them out and multi-scale up. That's a completely different, you can use things like mean field theories and stuff like that, then to, uh, to, to go up to the continuum level, right, without, um, but DPD, we find, is a good balance, gives us a good balance between physical, rea physical realism, right, and computational cost. Okay, so, so one, one other, another question. Uh, you, you explained how to derive the AIJ parameter, okay? Mm -hmm. You could derive from Flory Huggins or... You could, in principle, also use a molecular dynamics. Simulation. So, so, so the the beauty of the beauty of the AIJ is that. Um, so let me share my screen again. <laughs> 
So the beauty of the AIJ beauty of the AIJ is that it can be a function. Right? It, so uh, it, I mean, it, it can be a number that you derive from a relationship, for example, like uh, incompatibility, you get 25 for AII. Um, you have this relationship for the Flory Huggins parameter, right? And the AIJ. Um, so, fine, uh, you get a number. But in principle, you can even think about this being a function itself. AIJ can itself be a function. So, it's basically all about the physics, right? So, basically, the physics of DPD is you need to have a right thermostat, which can be the this one, uh, the basic DPD thermostat, or it can be some, some other ther ther thermostat. And then what you have to think is, I need to define my in interaction potentials in a physically realistic way. Basic way is for, uh, is using the, the, the original linear decreasing interaction, right? But uh, for, for example, I didn't show you here today because I didn't have the time. I wish I had. Um, we've actually uh, worked also on entangled polymeric systems. Okay. And we can even introduce in the forces, for example, uh, Fini type Fini potentials, Fini P potentials. Um, we can introduce any sort of so don't, don't, don't feel limited by the fact that you have this FC that was proposed in 1992 by Hugerbroeke, right? Or whatever it's pronounced, it's Dutch, it's unpronounceable by definition. Uh, um, uh, but, um, um, but also r rather think of it as like in the core modified case, okay? think of it as an opportunity to introduce physically realistic interaction potentials. If you think about it that way, it becomes extremely powerful. All right? Yeah, and what about the, the other parameters when you extended the model? Yeah, so for example, let's go, uh, okay, let me go to the suspensions, because that's the only extended model that I used today. All right, here we go. So in this case, right, we have the three, the three regular, so, so to speak, the regular uh, uh, forces. But then we have the non-contact forces. So we had to, this is how we introduced the hydrodynamics. So basically, um, uh, of, uh, so the long range hydrodynamics, uh, so the, 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 the short range hydrodynamics is capped here, there, between the surface and a certain distance, omega, which is like 10 to the minus 5R. Can you see my pointer? Yes, yes. Yes. So, so here I, I, we, we define a delta which is basically 1.5 times 10 to the minus five the, times the radius of the particle. Um, and below this, which is essentially at the, at, when they're very, very close together, we cap the uh, uh, hydrodynamic force, and then we let it vary with H or R. Um, uh, okay. And then here we have the electrostatics. Again, uh, so uh, it's short range electrostatics uh, away from very far away from the surface. It doesn't exist. Um, uh, but then uh, it's exponentially decreasing, but you can make it more active or less active or sh more shielded or less shielded. Right. Mm -hmm. So contact forces. And then we just took because we wanted to look at the influence of the frictional forces. OK, we just took the frictional model that was proposed, this was actually Brownian dynamics code uh, that was made by Seto, uh, that was proposed by Seto, right? RL in 2013. So we just took those forces, which are contact forces, and we added them to, to the model, okay? 
So we're not limited by the FC, the conservative force. In this case, we took the realistic, what we thought were realistic uh, forces that were present in the system. And we found physically acceptable descriptions for them. And we just introduced them in the system. Right? So, so I think, um, so I, I, I think that's one of the beauties of DPD. You can explicitly deal with all the forces and all the interparticle interactions. Okay, thank you, Jean, for the explanation. Very of, nice. Of course, the more forces you have and the more particles you have in your system, um, the, 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 the longer the calculation time, right? So, for example, in the genus, in the genus systems, we have the two polymer blends, we have 16,000. Uh, I don't know if Philippe is, uh, I think Philippe is on the line um, and he can correct me, but I think it's 16,000 polymer uh, beads for each phase, right? Uh, 16 so, polymer chains, so. Uh, so how many, how many, Philippe, can you confirm? 16,000 16, polymer chains normally. 16,000 poly polymer chains per phase, right? Or is that for the two phases? For, for both phases. Okay, so, okay. All right. Thanks a lot, John, for the explanation. And very nice talk. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, right. thanks everyone. Uh, if no one has uh, wants to ask a last question. Everybody wants to go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can ask for one more clarification. Okay, there you go, shoot. So, what do you mean by a soluble surfactant in a multi-phase system? Will you consider nodes inside sulfate to be soluble in a multi-phase system or insoluble? SDS, yes, sorry. This is not very clear. So, so, so soluble, um, uh, so essentially soluble means that the solvent can, the, the surfactant um, can actually migrate and, and uh, uh, my, my, migrate into, into the phase. Um, and, um, um, well, but each one, because you have two phases there. Yes. So you have to define uh, what phase you are talking about. Yeah, we're talking, so, so in this case, we're talking about, so in all the cases I showed, we're talking about sol soluble in water. Ah, when, okay. So it's soluble in the dispersed phase in water. Okay, so, so you mean the heavier phase, or lighter phase, nothing to do with the density? No. But normally such a thing as a part, uh, long chain, like you say, node against sulfate or something like that, it'll concentrate on the interface, right? Um, yes. No, I mean, the surfactant, look, the surfactant will always want to concentrate on the interface. But how do you, uh, okay. Because it's, 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 because it's affined to both, it's affined to both phases, okay. right? Um, okay. So that's essential. Yeah. Just say it's soluble in water or not. Okay. Yes. So soluble in water. In this case, in the dispersed phase, in water. So this is a water in oil emulsion. Okay. The result I showed you was for was for water in oil. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. My pleasure. Thanks, time, Yuri. Okay. I think it's time. So, uh, I think it's time to wrap it up. Yep. Let us uh, thank again, Professor John Mai for the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for listening. And uh, if anybody has any more questions or want to discuss anything, just let me know, an email, I'm just an email away. <laughs>